Welcome to the Principles of Immunotherapy Part 3, Cancer Immunotherapy. In previous videos, we talked about the various specialists that are involved in the treatment of cancer, and we talked about medical oncologists and that they specialize in systemic therapies like chemotherapy. We talked about their background and that they are the trained in systemic therapies and usually the central coordinator of care between all the team members. We talked about the various types of systemic therapy, and usually they're administered intravenously, IV, or orally. And we've talked about in previous videos, chemotherapy and targeted therapies. And in this video, we'll be talking about immunotherapies. As a quick review, we talked about chemotherapies and all the various types of chemotherapy, and also examples of each of the chemotherapies that are often used, usually in combination, in gastroesophageal cancers. We talked about how chemotherapy's goal is to inhibit cells that are dividing, which is the definition of cancer. However, that there are side effects to these treatments because some of our normal cells also divide. We then shifted towards a video on targeted therapies in that they are leveraging our understanding of the genetics of cancer and that we can target specific abnormalities in the cancer, hopefully, leading to fewer side effects and a more precise uh, targeting of those cancer cells. Examples of targeted therapies included small molecules, which are usually oral, and antibodies, which uh, we went through a number of them, including uh, trastuzumab for HER2, ramucirumab for VEGF receptor 2, zolbituximab, which will be coming online soon for Claudin 18.2 and others. And we also talked about that there is a overlap with targeted therapies and immunotherapies because these targeted therapies that are antibodies are actually stimulating the immune system. And that's shown here, where although antibodies have a number of ways that they work, the mechanisms of action are to block receptor signaling of cancer cells and de degrade those proteins, but also they can elicit an immune response by recruiting immune cells specifically natural killer cells through the back end of their antibody. And this is called antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, or ADCC. We also looked at other ways that these antibodies can work, and specifically, these bispecific T-cell engagers, or bites, can bind to a protein of interest, say, for example, HER2, but also specific binding to effector immune cells like T-cells or CD8 cytotoxic lymphocytes and bring them into vicinity of each other through these uh, bivalent antibodies. We also talked about zolbituximab, which primarily works through this immune response by eliciting ADCC. We also talked about angiogenesis and its importance in cancer cells and that inhibitors to angiogenesis or anti-angiogenesis agents, specifically ramucirumab, an antibody to VEGF receptor 2, and regorafenib, a about small molecule, which will be coming online shortly as well because of a positive study, which inhibits on the inside of the receptor, are drugs that inhibit blood vessel formation to the tumors. So although these are so-called targeted therapies, they all can have a role in eliciting an immune response, as we'll see shortly. Then we moved on to principles of immunotherapy. And in the first part, we described the basics of how the immune system works, that the lymphatic channels or the lymphatic system are important in that these lymph nodes throughout our body filter our tissues, and also that the bone marrow and the thymus gland are important in the development of these uh, immune cells that start in the bone marrow as hematopoietic stem cells and differentiate into the components that we're interested, the white blood cells. And more specifically, we talked about all the different types of white blood cells listed here. We talked about the two main arms of the immune system that these cells make up, and that is the innate immune system, which is a general nonspecific first line of defense and a quick response of which there are a number of different cells involved, and an adaptive or acquired immunity that is learned a little bit slower but more specific. We talked about antigen-presenting cells and major compatibility complex or MHC molecules that antigen presenting cells use to bridge and learn or teach uh, the 
acquired immunity cells, namely T cells and B cells. And they do this um, through a specific interaction with a specific antigen that is being presented on either MHC class one molecules, which all of our cells express, both normal and cancer cells. And through this interaction can recruit cytotoxic lymphocytes, which are CD8 positive through the specific T cell receptor engagement. Or we can have MHC class two molecule expression, which is on professional antigen presenting cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. And again, through specific interaction of the antigen, with the T cell receptor of a helper T cell or CD4 positive cells. We talked about how if we have a gastric or esophageal cancer in place, that cancer cells are dividing, proliferating, and turning over and releasing its contents, including antigens and damage-associated molecular patterns or DAMPs that filter to regional lymph nodes around the area of the cancer. And in those lymph nodes, antigen-presenting cells like dendritic cells will intake those molecules and then present them on their MHC class two molecules. And then if you have T cells with a T cell receptor that specifically recognizes those antigens, then those T cells are selected, activated, and then proliferate. And that is through the MHC class one and TCR uh, interaction. And ultimately, as these cells are recruited, this orchestra of cells come together to effect an immune response to the tumor cell and kill it. And this is described in the seven steps of the cancer immunity cycle, starting with the release of antigens, uptake of, of the antigen presenting cells and presentation so that it can select specific T cells that recognize those antigens and the army created of those T cells will traffic to the areas of wherever there is cancer, infiltrate into the cancer, recognize the cancer through the MHC class one that the cancer cell is expressing with its antigen and then effect a cell kill. So this is how it normally should work. In part two, we talked about how cancer cells evade that system. There are a number of hallmarks of cancer, but we focused on how they avoid the immune destruction. And we went through all the specific mechanisms in each of those steps, including just having lower numbers of antigens and antigens are there that are not immunogenic, that there are a suppressive cytokines that the tumor secretes to recruit suppressive immune cells like regulatory T cells and others, and also directly inhibit antigen presentation on the dendritic cells through a number of ways, including decreasing the dendritic cells MHC presentation. We also talked about in the lymph node checkpoints can be upregulated, specifically CTLA-4, so that it will turn off this activation of these cytotoxic T cells. We also talked about how cancer cells can decrease T cell trafficking and infiltration into the tumors through a number of means, including faulty or dysregulated blood vessel formation or angiogenesis. Then we talked about, finally, within the tumor area, how cancers can evade recognition of cytotoxic T cells by downregulating MHC class one expression so that cancer cells are evading the T cell recognition, also decreasing antigen expression altogether. And finally, the cancer cells can upregulate their expression of immune checkpoints in the cancer cell itself, including and namely specifically with PDL1 uh, as a inhibitory checkpoint. We also talked about how the cancer cells can create a suppressive tumor microenvironment with cytokines and recruitment of immunosuppressive cells like regulatory T cells, et cetera, similar to how it can do that in the lymph node to inhibit T cell training. We talked about the three categories then of this cancer immunity cycle, how cancer evades the immune system specifically the immune desert, where T cells are not being trained for various reasons. And therefore, when you take a biopsy of the tumor tissue, there are no immune cells infiltrating there. In other words, it's, it's an immune desert. We talked about the immune excluded subgroup that although the T cells and other immune infiltrate are nearby, they're not penetrating into this area. And then finally, we talked about the immune inflamed that there is a successful immune response that's getting into the tumor bed but through the upregulation of checkpoints and immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, 
they're present, but they're arrested. And with each of these different mechanisms, then we talked about how different therapeutic approaches, targeted approaches for each of these should be considered. So first let's talk about the immune desert. The immune desert, if you were looking at a tumor bed and biopsy, this would be referred to as a cold tumor. It's not having any immune infiltrating cells. So one of the ideas and goals of immunotherapy in this situation in the immune desert subgroup is to try and give therapies that can induce a response so that T cells can infiltrate into the tumor and therefore turn a cold tumor to so-called a hot or inflamed tumor. So we want to try and increase the T cell priming in those first three steps in order to then have those T cells infiltrate into the tumor later on. So how can we do that? We're gonna take it step by step, starting with the first step of this cancer immunity cycle. How can we increase antigen release? Well, we can give cytotoxic therapy. And so although we've talked about chemotherapy and we will talk about radiation therapy in that it's directly inhibitory to cancer cells, in addition, as a positive consequence, the cancer cells will release more of their antigens and damps, damage-associated molecular patterns, that then can filter to the antigen-presenting cells like dendritic cells, and then in the lymph node, jumpstart that training of T cells. And so this is shown here in this figure where radiation, chemotherapy, anything that can cause cell kill of the cancer cells can increase release of these antigens. And again, jumpstart the presentation of these antigens by antigen-presenting cell dendritic cells through MHC molecules to recruit, select, activate, and proliferate the immune system that's an adaptive acquired response to the tumor. In addition to that, we can work on this second step with cancer antigen presentation. We can try to increase the abundance of antigens through vaccines, or we can increase directly on antigen-presenting cells their ability to present these antigens to T cells. So first with vaccines in this schema, administer a vaccine that's been designed with specific antigens of the cancer and therefore get them to go into antigen presenting cells and again, jumpstart the T cells. So this is the concept of a, of a vaccine for cancer therapy. There are numerous types of cancer vaccines that are listed here that are a little bit outside the scope of this, but just be aware that it's quite a complex field. There's a lot of different approaches and a lot of active research in this area. But again, in general, what the idea is, is that we're giving a, a vaccine with specific antigens that are specific to the cancer cells that, so that dendritic cells can present them and recruit the immune effector cells and therefore elicit an immune response. There is a lot that goes into this in terms of, of what to put into the cancer vaccine or a personalized neoantigen vaccine, for example, where the cancer cells are obtained and identify what the genetic mutations are in that particular cancer. And then from that, try and predict which one of those mutations are actually going to be immunogenic. We talked about that most of these cancer mutations are not immunogenic but there's been a lot of research to try and predict and validate what types of mutations will actually elicit an immune response. And so from a given patient's cancer, we can try and pinpoint which ones of these will be immunogenic and then select those to put into the vaccine and then administer. This again is referred to as a personalized neoantigen vaccine. In addition to the vaccines, I mentioned that we can also give drugs or therapies that can try to facilitate the antigen presentation on dendritic cells and other antigen presenting cells. We talked about how there's a lot of checkpoints on these cells, on all immune cells that are either activating or inhibitory. And so we can leverage that understanding now and design therapies that, for example, CD40 is an activating receptor on macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. And so by designing an antibody therapy, that binds to that receptor and activates it, referred to as an agonist of this receptor, it is trying to stimulate all of these cells functions in order to present antigen to T cells and other uh, immune uh, specter cells. In contrast, 
we have inhibitory checkpoints on these cells. An example of one of these is this SERP alpha, which binds to CD47 on cancer cells. And this is what is referred to as a don't eat me signal. So it's inhibiting phagocytosis. Cancer cells express CD47, which binds to this inhibitory molecule SERP alpha and turns macrophages ability to phagocytose the cell and destroy it off. Antibodies have been designed to either of these receptors that block this interaction so that it releases this ability of macrophages to then phagocytose uh, this cancer cell and then start to present these antigens on its surface and stimulate that immune response in training other cells. So agonistic to checkpoints or antagonist to inhibitory checkpoints. In addition to steps one and two, we can work on step three, where we talked about in the central lymph node, upregulation of ch inhibitory checkpoints like CTLA-4 can dampen the activation of T cells. And so by using antibodies to that interaction has been shown to uh, elicit a stronger priming and activation of these cells. And that's shown here, where in the setting of an inactive T cell, because it's expressing CTLA-4, again, that is because in the environment of the lymph node, the tumor through cytokines and recruitment of immunosuppressive cells like regulatory T cells have led to upregulation of this inhibitory checkpoint, which binds to the dendritic cell and effectively turns off this activation step. Antibody therapies have been designed like anti-CTLA-4 that bind to CTLA-4 and blocking that interaction which releases the agonistic receptor CD28 to be able to bind and then proceed to proliferate these T cells and select for them so they can go in and cause their effect downstream at the area of the tumor. So these types of antibodies have been designed and some familiar ones that you may recognize are ipilimumab and trimilimumab. In addition to trying to address the problems of the immune desert, what about the situation where we've created enough T cells, they're getting around, but they're not identifying and, and penetrating into the area of the tumor cells? In that situation, remember, angiogenesis was a problem. So we can think of drugs that are going to inhibit angiogenesis or anti-angiogenesis drugs and inhibitors to other suppressive pathways. So again, if we have uh, CD8 T cells that are trying to get to where the tumor is, but they can't get through, Anti-angiogenesis drugs like ramucirumab, an anti-VEGF receptor 2 antibody, and others like regorafenib, which binds to the inside of the same receptor, can effectively decrease angiogenesis in the area of the tumor. And so in addition to decreasing the blood vessel formation and starving the tumor, remember we talked about how these blood vessels that are formed in the area of the tumor are not normal. They're tortuous, they're dysregulated, and by giving anti-angiogenesis drugs like ramucirumab, this can normalize those blood vessels so that the cells of the immune system, like CD8 cells, can better infiltrate into the area. And that's shown here where anti-angiogenesis drugs can lead to vessel normalization and therefore allow for better infiltration of these cytotoxic T cells into the tumor bed. Other inhibitors of suppressive pathways, another example is CXCR4 inhibitors, a pathway that's important in shunning tumor cells from infiltrating into the tumor. And so by giving inhibitors to that, have been suggested in preclinical models that this could be helpful. And these types of drugs are in the clinic in clinical trial status at the moment. Finally, we get to the immune inflamed subgroup where all of these other processes seem to be working relatively well and cytotoxic T cells and other immune cells are penetrating into the tumor, but because of the mechanisms that cancer cells have acquired, they are going under the radar and arresting the response. So what therapies can we design in this particular situation? Well, first we're gonna talk about for step six, trying to enhance the expression of MHC1 on the cancer cells so that T cells can better recognize them, as well as trying to artificially introduce an army of cytotoxic lymphocytes um, through various means. So first, remember we talked about in the target of therapy video how cells signal through various molecules from one, one molecule to the next in a downstream pattern to try and reprogram the cell 
to express certain genes that would uh, be able to allow for better proliferation, invasion, and cell survival. And one of those molecules was MEK. And it has been shown in preclinical models that MEK inhibitors, drugs designed, small molecule drugs that are usually oral, that come and bind to MEK and inhibit it at that step, can lead to increased MHC1 expression at the membrane of a cancer cell and therefore allow for T cells to better recognize uh, the cancer. And that's shown here where MEK inhibitors can lead to increased T cell mediated cytotoxicity and because MHC1 is being upregulated at the cell membrane. In addition to that concept, we talked about how bispecific T cell engagers or bites which have two different epitopes, one to a target on the cancer cell of interest, for example, one of many could be HER2, but also on the other part of the antibody, uh, recognizing a cytotoxic T cell. And so this can bring these uh, two cells into their the vicinity and try and facilitate a T cell response. And remember, if we look at the T cell receptor, that there's a lot of different components to the T cell receptor, but but one of the common epitopes used in these bites is CD3, part of the T cell receptor to help drag the T cell in the vicinity of the cancer cell so that it can enhance an immune response. This is shown here where we have an inactive T cell floating around that's not engaging its tumor cell. However, with an antibody designed to, bring, to bind to any tumor associated antigen, like for example, HER2, and with the other part of the antibody binding to CD3 can bring these two cells into their vicinity and activate the T cell. So this is a therapy that is in active investigation, not approved in any situations, but has some promise. In addition to therapies that can be administered, we also talk about cellular therapy, where we can, in the first setting, try and obtain a biopsy of the patient's cancer, isolate tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that are in the area of the tumor, and then expand them in a cell Petri dish, ex vivo it would be called, and then when you have a whole bunch of them, reinfuse it into the patient and hope that these T cells are actually eliciting an immune response, but we're just trying to amplify this response artificially. A more elegant uh, approach, which is now becoming uh, very interesting and intensively being studied, are CAR T cells and T cell receptor therapies, where the T cells from a patient are extracted and then they're genetically engineered to then expand and then reinfuse into the patient. So of these three types of therapies, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes was what, what I would think of as a first generation approach where you just take the T cells, expand them, and then try and reinfuse them and hope for the best. In a more elegant approach through T cell receptor uh, therapy, where you are taking these T cells, genetically modifying them, and then reinfusing them, or with CAR T cells, creating what's called a chimeric antigen receptor or CAR on the T cell and, and genetically modifying them in that way and then reinfusing. And the difference between an introduced TCR versus an introduced CAR cell, on the left, we have the introduced TCR where it's basically um, a genetically engineered T cell receptor to a specific epitope but that works through the cancer cells MHC class one mechanism. In contrast, the introduced CAR cell is more like an antibody where this specific epitope that's been engineered on, on the CAR T cell is binding to a specific antigen, usually on the surface of the cancer cell, and it does not require MHC class one um, activation. And so both of these have a lot of interest and are under intensive investigation at the moment. There are some examples with early phase data where the antigen selected is Claudin 18.2 or HER2, for example. And again, just to show pictorially what's going on, a patient's blood is taken, T cells are extracted, they're then engineered to express a specific uh, receptor and then expanded and then reinfused and hope for infiltration into the tumor and targeting of the cancer cells based on the specific epitopes that have been designed. That's shown here, a CAR T example, where T cells are taken from the bloodstream, extracted, they're engineered to express a specific um, um, epitope 
and then these are reinfused into the patient to go back and find that target and elicit a, a cell kill. Again, examples of CAR T's in the clinic in clinical trials at the moment are HER2 as the antigen or as Claudin 18.2. In addition to T cell cellular therapy, because NK cells are, are emerging as a very important immune effector cell in terms of cancer immunotherapy, we've already talked about this first component, antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity, where we can design antibodies that are optimized in the FC domain, the back end of the antibody, to recruit NK cells through the CD16 receptor into the area of the cancer cell to affect tumor cell kill. And the other end would be to a specific um, um, epitope of interest. For example, HER2, again, or any other molecule that's expressed on the a cancer cell surface. In addition to that, similar to how we had um, bispecific T cell engagers or bites, we can do the same thing, but now they bind to specific receptors on the NK cell to try and bring them into close vicinity of a cancer cell. We can also design CAR NK cells, and these again are also in very early phases of clinical trial design to try and create an army of NK cells that bind to a specific uh, antigen that's expressed on the cancer cell. There are other agonistic molecules that can also enhance the activity of NK cells in the area of a cancer uh, tumor bed. Examples of antibodies that are eliciting ADCC are listed here, like trastuzumab, zolbituximab, um, and bemurtizumab to HER2, Claudin 18.2, and FGFR2, respectively. And remember that NK cells have a whole slew of activating receptors and a whole slew of inhibitory receptors. And so antibodies or targeted therapies to each of these, either agonistic antibodies to enhance the activity of the NK cell or antagonistic antibodies that will inhibit the inhibitory receptors are all being designed and being evaluated in clinical trials to see if we can augment an NK response to cancer cells. Finally, in the last step, what I refer to as sort of the last stand of the cancer, if all of this is working properly, you're getting um, a nice immune uh, response, but it's being arrested because in the tumor area, there's a suppressive tumor microenvironment and or upregulation of inhibitory checkpoints like PDL1. What can we do there? We can design therapies to address that problem. The main one, and again, what a lot of people think of when they hear immunotherapy, are anti PD1 or PDL1 checkpoint inhibitors. And so this is an example of a T cell that is appropriately identifying an antigen that is being expressed on a cancer cell through MHC class one, but there is an interaction because the cancer cell is expressing PDL1, an inhibitor or a checkpoint, and it's binding to PD1 on the T cell and turning off the activation of the T cell and inhibiting T cell kill. So there are designed therapies that are antibodies that bind to either PD1 or to PDL1 that block this interaction and therefore allow the T cell to proceed and kill the cancer cell. And there is a whole host of, of uh, antibodies now available, either already approved, like pembrolizumab, Keytruda, or nivolumab, Opdivo, and others like tistolizumab, which just had a positive phase three study, and a whole host of others. I've tried to list as many as I can think of, um, but there are so many now, and, and ultimately they work very similarly, and in my mind are interchangeable. Anti-PD-1 antibodies bind to PD-1 on T cells, and anti pdl one antibodies listed here bind to PDL1 on the cancer cell, effectively doing the same thing, which is to block the interaction of these molecules to release the break and allow T cells to then proceed and kill the cancer cell. So this gets to looking at the tumor biopsy and looking at the biomarker PDL1 to evaluate is PDL1 expressed in this tumor? or not. And so you can see the different levels of expression from completely negative to very low to moderate to very high. And we do know that the four main subtypes of gastroesophageal cancer through the Cancer Genome Atlas have different expression profiles of PDL1. For example, the genomically stable diffuse type signet ring tumors are usually completely negative for PDL1. In contrast, 
the MSI high tumors or deficient mismatch repair or EBV positive tumors are usually very strongly expressing PDL1 at high levels. And so this has implications because the diffuse type or the immune desert ge uh, genomically stable um, are in this category and using or attempting to use a checkpoint inhibitor to PD-1, PDL one in this situation will not cause an immune response because there's no T cells there to begin with. In contrast, in the situation where you have a lot of PDL one expression, a lot of immune infiltrate, it's all just being arrested by this checkpoint. This is where this type of therapy is most beneficial because those cells are prime. They're ready to go. They just need to release that last remaining checkpoint to allow for T cell kill. So we've talked about all of these different strategies now for each of the different steps. And as you can see, it's quite complex, but that ultimately there are a couple of learning points to, to take from this presentation. And the first is that this is a very complex system, the immune system in general, how it typically should work normally, then how cancers evade the, the immune system response and then all of the various ways that we can try and re-engage the immune system to recognize and kill that cancer. Therefore, you can imagine that a multi-pronged approach will be important and that trying to leverage each of these aspects will ultimately be the key. I like to also point out that although chemotherapy and radiotherapy are designed to directly kill cancer cells, they do have the benefit of helping to release antigens of the cancer and, and stimulate or jumpstart this first few steps to help the cancer antigen presentation and priming and selection of T cells. And so although chemotherapy and radiation sometimes get a bad reputation, they can be imperative in this whole process. I want to also point out, and I mentioned earlier, that checkpoint inhibitors like PD-1 and PDL one inhibitors, which are the most common or more, the, the ones that you first think of when you hear immunotherapy, basically because this was the first wave of immunotherapy drugs that were successful and, and as we know, are available already for gastroesophageal cancer, are only one of many facets of how we can try and stimulate the immune system. And finally, that we really need to try and target these immunotherapy strategies based on what any given patient's cancer looks like. And we talked about how um, if a patient's cancer has a lot of pd one expression, it makes a lot of sense to use a PD-1 therapy. And in contrast, one that does not doesn't make as much sense. So if we think of a metaphor of dancing T cells, it all depends on what the tumor bed looks like in terms of what the appropriate therapy would be. If, for example, we have a room full of T cells around the cancer cells, but the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway is extremely upregulated. We can turn up the volume by giving anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1 therapies and have the T cells dance. In contrast, if we have an empty dance floor, just cancer cells, but no T cells, there's no dancing. You could turn up the volume as much as you want. There's no one to dance. There's no T cells around. And so we need to work on other ways to advertise and get T cells interested in going to the dance in the first place. We need to open the doors to let those T cells in. And then we can consider adding a higher volume to be able to allow those T cells to dance. So ultimately we want the T cells to dance, but we need to target the therapies in an appropriate way to first get the T cells to the dance floor. And then if they are there, then use the appropriate therapies to really turn up the volume. In this video, we built on the part one and two of the principles of immunotherapy videos where we first learned how the immune system normally works to detect and eradicate cancer, and then how cancer cells evade that system. Here we talked about through each of the different steps of the cancer immunity cycle, how we can try to stimulate an immune response. We talked about how even chemotherapy and radiation can help to jumpstart an immune response. We talked about the common checkpoint inhibitors, but that's only one facet of all of the types of immunotherapy. And that most of these strategies that we've talked about have theoretical bases, have some preclinical uh, validation, have some early phase clinical trial validation, but are not readily available 
for prime time in the clinics yet, but that there is promise and that over the next years, there's no doubt in my mind that many of these strategies will be breakthroughs to help uh, stimulate the immune system and, and lead to better clinical outcomes for our patients. So in the next video, we'll be moving on to molecular testing and the principles of trying to use biomarkers to help us identify which patients will be best suited for the various target therapies and immunotherapies that we have available. So stay tuned for that. Thank you.